you. So I became interested in studying social determinants of health uh, for one particular reason. And that is that a particular social determinant of health may be related and associated with a whole bunch of different health outcomes. So it may give us a particularly uh, effective approach to uh, improving health and preventing disease. Um, so this is something that's been known kind of anecdotally, but I was able to work with colleagues here recently, um, Shirag Patel, who's now at Harvard, John Yonides, and Mark Cullen, to try to quantify this for one particular social determinant of health income. And our question was, how many things, how many risk factors disease for disease is this one thing, income, actually related to? Uh, you might imagine that there'd be a lot of particular uh, bias in, in uh, the studies that are published. Not many people want to publish a study that says, income isn't associated with this risk factor. So we were curious to kind of quantify this in an unbiased way. So we looked at income and 330 different risk factors for disease. And what we found, uh, the depth of those associations and strengths of those associations um, even surprised me. We did have out of sample validation, uh, accounted for multiple comparisons. And what we found is that there were 66 out of these 330 risk factors that were pretty strongly associated with income. And these were really over a wide range of things. So they included things like blood, blood lead, exposure to mercury, HDL cholesterol, um, and a lot of components of uh, diet that came from from eating more uh, fruits and vegetables. And so this kind of uh, supports the general idea that uh, if we can focus on social determinants of health, it might be a particularly effective way to kind of supplement what we're doing at an individual uh, level uh, with, uh, with drugs or sort of more targeted interventions. I want to be clear that I don't think those are sort of mutually exclusive options. It doesn't mean, well, we should stop treating people uh, with statins, for example. It just means by addressing social determinants of health that all of those sort of individual targeted things can get a boost and we can really have a, a potentially cost-effective way to do a better job of improving people's health. So you may be saying, well, this seems pretty complicated. All of these things, if they're very correlated with each other, uh, and the answer is yes, this is pretty complicated. Uh, so this is a paper that I worked on with my colleague uh, Bob Hyatt up at UCSF, uh, where, we, where we put together a model of how socioeconomic, behavioral, biological, and things in the physical uh, environment were related to uh, breast cancer incidents. And so what we did is over a period of uh, several years, we've gotten people together with expertise in each of these areas and kind of mapped out how all these things are related. Uh, but this is still kind of a very simplified version of the way social determinants probably uh, actually work. Uh, one of my favorite posters that maybe you've seen before is from Roche on uh, the cellular and molecular uh, uh, pathways. So I used to have this on my office wall for a while as kind of inspiration. So this is what many decades of work in molecular biology has shown us uh, for, uh, for the way the body works and the complexity of these biological pathways. And so this is kind of my goal of what I think, uh, I don't think the social world is necessarily uh, any simpler than that. Um, and so we want to start taking approaches to kind of recognize the complexity. But that, that does come with some challenges. So how do we make sense of this when things are so correlated and so complicated? And I think here too, we can also in the so social determinants of health field, uh, learn from what's done in, uh, been done in molecular biology. And so uh, one approach is kind of taking an approach with uh, social determinants of health that's similar to the GWAS approach uh, used in biology, where we take a whole bunch of genes and we look at a prediction model of what predicts a particular outcome. So I've been doing this in a, in a smaller way over the years with a number of colleagues. Here's just an example of looking at a number of psychological and social factors uh, and how they predict uh, onset of adolescent obesity among girls. We're able to sort of... Uh, uh, confirm a lot of findings that were known in the literature, so income and education were important predictors. But by taking this, casting this wide net uh, for, a, for a whole bunch of different risk factors, here we were only looking at 100, but it was sort of more than what's been looked at typically, uh, we were able to kind of find potential new causes of the uh, onset of adolescent obesity, things like anxiety, interoceptive awareness, and many things having to do with eating disorders that were also related to uh, higher weight gain among girls. One thing I've noticed in this work over the years is that 
uh, what we see in social determinants of health is similar to what we see actually in GWAS studies. So on the right here are um, the size of association between different uh, SNPs, uh, genetic mutations, or uh, uh, genotypes for uh, obesity. So we have these really strong effects like FTO, and then they get a little weaker, and then weaker and weaker still. And what we found lately in genetics, I mean, 10 years ago, people were thinking, oh, there was a gene for this, gene for that, or even sort of, you know, a top hit sort of world. Um, but what's happened now is we found, okay, it's not this, you know, five or 10 genes for a particular complex trait like obesity, but it's actually thousands of different genes with tiny, tiny effects uh, that actually add up to sort of a substantial genetic component for disease. So what we're doing right now in social determinants of health, we're still in this sort of top hits era where we're, based on our data sets, are really kind of only identifying a few factors that are related to uh, diseases or, or, or risk factors such as BMI. But I think where we need to head is sort of looking at this sort of tail of the distribution that we're now seeing in genetics, and that there may be really thousands of other factors uh, that we're beginning to measure, that, but that we haven't analyzed yet, that may be important things to think about in terms of targeting social determinants of health. So how did this happen in uh, genetics? Uh, you know, we're here at a big data conference. It was because of big data. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and it's amazingly, we were talking about the sort of seven, at the beginning, uh, the seven years that we've been here. I mean, really, just in those 10 years, the sample sizes for the genetic studies have gone from around 10,000 up to uh, many hundreds of thousands. So that's enabled an identification of these sort of small effect, uh, or, or small effect uh, gene sizes. And I think we need to do the same thing um, with social determinants of health research. Another sort of point of this slide, actually, is a, is a point that uh, Dr. Bivens Domingo brought up earlier. You know, we're, we're sort of lagging behind in social determinants of health research, but maybe we can uh, sort of correct some of the things that were done. So the, uh, the color coding here is for uh, the, the blue studies are studies that were done in Europeans. And so as we sort of move to data, again, I'd like to echo her comments that for social determinants of health research as well, we need to think about having more inclusive populations. So our research benefits everyone. Now this, of course, is just about prediction. But what we really want to know is, if we change social determinants of health, uh, will, will health actually improve? And so that's a really important distinction I want to make. So what I want to talk about is something that you can think about as the CRISPR for social determinants of health. So uh, what you would do in uh, genetics is you do a, you know, you'd identify something, you do a gene knockout study, or you do CRISPR, and you'd isolate this one particular, uh, one particular gene and look at what the effects are in, in, uh, for a particular health outcome. So for a lot of social determinants of health, that's not something we can do. But the sort of CRISPR for social uh, determinants of health, the sort of closest analog we have, is quasi-experimental studies. And that's where we take this big, complex constellation of things that happen, and we try to isolate one little change that happened and see what the effects are on health. Um, so I'll take, I'll, I'll take uh, a minute here and give sort of two examples of how we've done that uh, with that same uh, social term of health that I talked about, uh, income. And so let's take the example of poverty. So poverty we know, and income I just showed, is correlated with a whole bunch of different things. How can we look at what the effects would be if we actually make it, made a change to poverty? You may be thinking, oh, that's impossible. We've been trying to, change, we've been trying to get rid of poverty uh, you know, for many, many years. Uh, how has this even happened? Well, actually, every day, you, know, you can just pick up a newspaper and find ways and policies and little things that are happening um, and big things that are happening to change poverty and change uh, the influence and the meaning of poverty for different people. So one example of this uh, that I've looked at is the earned income tax credit. So this is a program that spends $70 billion a year uh, for working families in the US and lifts 4 million children out of poverty. So it's a really big program. And this, this map here just shows sort of the depth of that program in different states. So, so like the high poverty states like Mississippi, nearly a third of the population benefits from this earned income tax credit. And the key for this sort of identification approach, or doing this natural experiment or quasi-experimental studies, is the fact that this wasn't just one program that was implemented in a single way for everyone at a single period of time. So each states have raised and lowered their benefits over time. The federal government has changed the policies in sort of nonlinear ways. Uh, sort of depending on the number of kids you have, you get more or less benefits. And so we can use all of this information uh, do, doing multiple types of studies to get at what the impact of this sort of change or changes in this policy uh, might be. 
the key here is that this isn't something that the individual changed, which, is, which can be highly confounded. So it's not that this person did something and earned more money, but there was an environmental change, a change in the social, uh, a change in this social determinant that changed how much money and this poverty benefit that people received. And so we've taken, to do, we've, uh, taken looks at this over the last uh, decade, really, um, and shown a lot of sort of positive benefits of this sort of EITC change. So fewer uh, low birth weight babies, reduced smoking, reduced food insecurity, higher HDL cholesterol, and even fewer colds. So we think a lot about social determinants of health and what governments can do for social determinants of health, but uh, corporations and businesses actually can do a lot as well. So I was fortunate to be involved in this project, uh, an evaluation project of when a uh, factory, actually this was the company uh, Knights Apparel, when they decided to start paying their workers a living wage uh, at a factory in the Dominican Republic. And so what was really unique about this is when the workers were hired, they didn't know that they were going to be receiving a, a living wage. They applied for, it was a, in a free trade uh, area in the Dominican Republic. They applied for a job. They received this job on the first day. Oh, actually, you're getting three and a half times uh, the salary you thought you were going to get. And so what we did is we found a similar factory, and we looked before and after in these individuals, and we said, what kind of difference does this make uh, to people's health? Uh, so right now, we've just done a short evaluation of this over about a year, but now this has been going on for about 10 years now, and so we're looking to go back and, and, and look at, over a longer period of time, how this has impacted people's health. We found fewer depressive symptoms, higher self-rated health, more protein intake, and more money spent on food from grocery stores rather than convenience stores. So I'd like to conclude here by saying and acknowledging, yes, things are very complex. This is not a, an easy thing to do. But by taking the time and learning from the approaches that have been done in sort of other fields, especially molecular biology, but in particular using big data, uh, I think we can really make progress in understanding social determinants of health. First of all, through environmental-wide association studies, we're really casting a wider net on the factors that we consider. So not kind of staying with the same five or ten things we've studied uh, for, for many years, but really expanding to sort of thousands of different things, thousands of things that are measured with mobile devices, measured through geographic information systems, and from other sources of, of administrative data. And then critically, we need to take what we learn there and look at things that have actually changed in the environment and do what, what um, you know, economists and sociologists and epidemiologists, epidemiologists have been doing for many years and look at how these changes affect health outcomes. But the key there, again, is that I think what we've been able to do in the past has been really limited because just like that genetic, uh, that arc of those genetic data I, I showed, I think a lot of these are very sort of small little impacts that accumulate. So we really need these large multi-hundred thousand person sample sizes in order to make progress. But it's a super exciting time. I think you know, now is the time that we're going to be able to achieve this. Uh, and hopefully we can all do that. Thank you.